Hey, welcome everybody into the Wells Tech Garage. For today's video, as the title suggests, guys, we are looking at a 2006 Honda Odyssey 3.5 liter today for a random multi-cylinder misfire that's going on with this thing. The customer's complaint is obviously a check engine light, but also that the engine itself kind of feels almost like it's trembling, like not exactly like a dead cylinder misfire, but just a little bit of shake, a little bit of roughness, especially at idle. It seems to get worse as the vehicle heats up. It seems to be a little bit better when the vehicle's cold. So let's go ahead and fire this thing up. I just want to show you guys that this, this thing's shaking a little bit. Now this thing does have 210,000 miles on it. Good old Hondas seem to run forever. But as you can see here, it might be hard for you to tell, but just put my hand on it. I can feel just a little bit of shake here, a little bit of shimmy. These engines are usually very, very smooth running. Um, it, just, it just shakes a little bit. It's just got this little shake to it. And the customer can feel that when they're sitting in the car. So we'll go ahead and shut it off. I'm going to leave the key on. Let's take a look at the codes that we have in this thing. I'm already in the engine computer. Like I said, 06 Odyssey. We'll pull codes out of the engine computer and look at what we've got here. Permanent codes. We're looking at a P0302. So cylinder 2, 304, 305, cylinders 4, cylinders 5, and a P0300, the good old random misfire. And then some 16C4, some sort of engine mount actuator control power circuit stuck off. So some sort of engine mount actuator is also apparently giving us issues. So let's take a look at our wonderful codes here. Uh, according to the sure track on here, we're looking spark plugs, ignition coils, intake gaskets, spark plug seals, throttle body, or fuel filter issues, apparently. That's what they're thinking it is. Our customer probably thought something along those lines, too, because as I look at the engine here, I have three new coils on the front of this engine, and the customer also told me that it's got six new spark plugs in it and three new coils on the backside as well. So the parts cannon's already been loaded up and fired at this thing with new spark plugs and coils. Um, didn't fix the problem. The problem is obviously still here. So we're at this point you're as a technician sitting in the car with the scan tool we want to look at a little bit more information here to give us a direction to go on a random misfire. It's something that's affecting more than one cylinder. So we're not looking at a stuck fuel injector. We're not looking at a single cylinder spark plug issue. We're looking at something that's affecting the entire engine. So I'm going to look at things like fuel trims. That's where I want to look first. See what our fuel trims are reading. So why don't we just go ahead and start there. We'll look at freeze frame data. And let's go ahead and grab, let's just grab that cylinder two misfire, grab our freeze frame off of there. Let's take a look. So we're sitting at 872 RPM. Um, we're looking at throttle position is reading about 16%. So throttle is just a little bit opened. Battery voltage is charging. Let's scroll down and see if we can find our fuel trims. Short term fuel trim bank one, 1.14. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the way this is written, um, a perfect zero would actually be written as a 1.0. Anything positive would be just like a positive fuel trim where the computer's adding fuel. There's a slight lean condition in the engine, so we'd be adding that 14% fuel. Um, anything underneath that 1.0, we would actually be subtracting fuel away. So it's kind of written in like, like Lambda is written. Um, short term for bank two is sitting at a perfect 1.0. We are in closed loop. Let's see if we can find some long term trims. There we go. AFFB AV is apparently our long terms, and it looks like both long terms are sitting at a perfect 1.0. Now, I, I highly doubt that this thing is running perfect. You know, a perfect 1.0 would be a 0% fuel adaptation. I highly doubt that it's running perfect. But I'm not thinking that we have a vacuum leak on this engine causing our misfire. I'm not thinking that we have, probably not thinking that we have a fueling issue on this engine. Um, otherwise, we would most likely see these things in the fuel trims or represented by the fuel trims. Let's go ahead and let's just look at one more cylinder. Let's look at cylinder five. And uh, let's just take a quick look at that and see what our trims are reading on here. So again, 1.14 and a 1.0. And same thing, both of our long terms also reading 1.0. So our fuel trims seem to 
be okay on here. So we have okay fuel trims, we have multi-cylinder misfire, we have new plugs, new coils. Where do we go next? Now, for those of you that are familiar with the Honda 3.5, you probably already know the direction that we're thinking. The direction is a valve issue. Honda 3.5s, like old cars, need to have their valves adjusted every so often. Why they still do it that way, I don't know, but they do. Valve adjustment is um, a maintenance item on here that at 105,000 miles, it is suggested to inspect the valves. Inspect for valve clearance, ad otherwise adjust only if noisy. So it is recommended that this customer were to inspect the valve clearance at 105,000. Now I have no way to know if that was done on this vehicle at 105. We're now at 210, we're now double that. So at this point, I could go to my customer and say, hey, your valves might be an issue. I don't know for sure. I have no way to tell you for sure at this point that your valves are an issue, but I think they might be. It's a maintenance item. Do you want me to do it? The customer's kind of wishy-washy. It's 210,000 miles. Do they want to throw a couple hundred dollars into a, a what if to an educated guess? Probably not. We need to find a way to prove it. And that's what we set out to do today. Find a way to prove that this thing needs a valve adjustment. So intake valves. Intake valves are kind of a dead giveaway by engine vacuum. Intake manifold vacuum. If we have an intake valve issue, like on all cars, we would expect to see a fluctuating vacuum gauge and also a lower overall manifold vacuum. Talking, you know, 15, 14, 13 inches of vacuum, maybe even lower, is what we would expect to see with an intake valve issue. So why don't we quick take a peek here, grab a pliers, and uh, let's take a look at what our intake vacuum reads on a gauge. Alright, so I got a gauge right here. I'm going to go ahead, I'll fire this up. Okay. Uh oh. Dead battery. Turn this charger back on. Alright. So, with this thing running, let's take a look at what we've got here. So, right now, our gauge, as you guys can see, is reading about about 15. Now this engine's cold. It's running through its cold start situation. Our, our throttle body is open just a little bit, so our vacuum is going to be lower on this cold start. Let's let this thing just warm up a hair, and our vacuum is going to go up. All right, look at that. It's amazing, 210,000 miles and we're pulling 21 inches of vacuum on this thing. I've seen engines with 100,000 miles not pull 21 inches of vacuum. So, needless to say, I don't think our intake valves are an issue. If our intake valves were the issue, I would expect to see this gauge lower, and I would also expect to see it, like I said, bouncing or fluctuating on there. So intake valves, probably okay. And that's common with these 3.5s. These 3.5s are common for the intake valves being okay. They're common for an exhaust valve issue. The exhaust valves on these engines are supposedly tightening up. That's what everybody calls it. They, they say that the exhaust valves are tightening the clearance or um, the, the, the gap is, is becoming less and it actually eventually could actually hold the exhaust valve open. But now I want a way to prove this. I just proved out that our intake valves are most likely okay. We need a way to prove out the exhaust valves to sell to the customer that this thing does need an adjustment where we can feel confident in that sale. How do we do it? In cylinder pressure transducer. We're gonna look at the pressure waveform that happens inside of the cylinder and we're gonna watch to see when our exhaust valve opens and closes. This is gonna change because of the wear or the less of the gap that our exhaust valve is um, being subjected to off of the cam. So why don't we go ahead and we'll pull the spark plug out and we'll throw our in-cylinder pressure transducer in here and we'll take a look at what we've got here. 
Now we're going to take a reading at idle on this one. Um, so we got a hose here just like a compression gauge. This is very similar to a compression test, uh, but it's all going to be done electronic with this transducer right here that hooks up to our lab scope. So I'm going to go ahead, thread this guy in here. And I'm just going to go into cylinder four because it's easy to get to. Oh, I suppose. I'm not going to be able to thread a transducer in there with a spark plug in the hole. Let's take that out first. Alrighty, spark plug's out. Looks pretty good. I don't see any sort of fouling or anything like that in there. It looks like an iridium plug. What do we got? We got an NGK IR, so a good quality spark plug in here. Um, I've heard that these Honda motors don't like cheap spark plugs. Keep that in mind. Uh, we do have a good quality plug in here. So let's go ahead and thread this um, transducer into the hole here. And let's get this all set up. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire this engine up. And obviously we're not going to have a combustion event on the cylinder because we have no spark. So what we're going to record is we're going re to record the piston traveling up and down, creating pressure and then traveling back down. Now normally, after that pi piston is on the compression stroke, what happens, we have the power stroke, we have the firing event inside of the cylinder. That's what's going to give us the power on the engine. On this waveform, we're going to actually just see the piston dragged back down because there was no firing event. So we got this set up. And for those of you that aren't familiar with these waveforms, go out to the Facebook groups. There's always waveforms being posted with really great lessons uh, revolving around them. So we're going to, you know, work our way through this one, just focusing on our exhaust valve today. So I got our transducer hooked up. We're going to have to hook it up to the lab scope now. Like so, we'll go in channel A with the transducer. And then I'm just going to run an ignition trigger, an ignition sink on channel 2. And all this is going to do is it's just going to tell me that our um, ignition event is supposed to be occurring at the right time. Now in order to make this happen, I'm going to leave the ignition coil plugged into the connector. Now you never want to run an engine with a coil just sitting there not sparking to anything. It's going to find, the electricity is going to find a way out somewhere. You want to give it its path. You want to give it its, its normal path back to ground. So what I'm going to do, install a spark plug into the boot of the coil. I'm going to plug it in like so. Now you could use a spark tester for this if you want and just take the spark tester, put it on a bolt here or something, something that's grounded. What I'm going to do instead, I'm just going to take a alligator leads here and I'm going to try and get on battery ground like so. And then I'm just going to go to the ground electrode of the spark plug. So all we're doing here is completing the path to ground. So now our spark will fire across our plug and then find its way back to ground instead of through the engine block through this cable back to the battery. So we'll get a nice ignition waveform here that we'll be able to use just as a sink trigger. Now I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm going to go with the, this looks like a brown or a tan wire on the outside of the connector here on the on this pin, we'll see if that's the right one. If it's not, we'll grab a different different pin. Um, make sure that that's on there. Our pressure transducer seems to all be hooked up. Let's grab the scope and take a look. We'll turn this guy on. We're using the WPS. We're using range one. And we'll run it to, let's run it to 200 PSI. And then let's turn on channel two we'll run a 20 volt on channel two. And all we're trying to do is to just look at the ground side, the control of this coil. We'll look at the coil being turned on and turned back off is hopefully what we'll capture here. If not, I'll just have to uh, re-stab it and see, uh, grab a different, um, different sink input. All right, let's fire this thing up and see, if, see what we got. Obviously, we're going to have a misfire. Now, cylinder four will be a dead Dead misfire. All right. It looks like our zoom on here is maybe 
zoomed in. Let's zoom that out. Let's take our time division, increase it. There we go. I didn't think that looked right. It looked like our PSI was way too high. Perfect, and I don't see our, oh, is it there? It's hard to tell. Let's stop this quick, move this up. Nope, not seeing it. Let's try and. There's something, okay. Oh, she just kicked up the RPM. It must have noticed the misfire and now kicked up our RPM. Let's stop it. So right after I got our ignition sync, we were at that base idle. Let's go back to there, and that's the one we're going to look at. So right about here, before our, you can actually see, you see these blue lines here? That's our peak compression on that cylinder. Right about here, we bumped up the RPM, and you can see our compression goes up with engine speed. So we're going to look right in here. Let's grab, let's grab this. Let's go ahead and zoom in. This is our cylinder four events. This is each peak compression of cylinder four. So cylinder four fires, cylinder four fires, cylinder four fires. These are all, we'll break this down into strokes in just a second. Let's take a look at what we've got. All right. So we have to just start with a quick, quick overview of what exactly it is that we're looking at here. Now this isn't a class on pressure transducers. S at some day in the future I hope to do one specifically on exactly everything that we're looking at here. I'm just going to do a really quick overview of what it is that we see. So let's, um, first of all, our red trace here, again, is our ignition sink. So this is telling me that our spark plug is firing just before top dead center peak of compression here. This, this peak right here where it, where it starts to, where it goes up and then comes back down, that is our peak of compression. We are firing our spark plug just before that, which we would expect to find, right? Ignition advance is always slightly before top dead center. We want to get that spark plug firing, especially at idle, a little bit sooner, and then we would see that advance change under different RPM loads. So, uh, that looks right. I'm going to go ahead and get that out of the way because it really doesn't matter for what we're looking at at the moment. So what we see here is a nice pretty graph of pressure. Okay, We're reading up to, what is the peak on this, about 60 or so, 58 psi, and then we're coming down into vacuum of about a negative 10, negative 11 psi. So our, our, vac our pressure inside the cylinder goes up, now normally here you would have your firing event where you're really high pressure inside the cylinder, right? That's forcing the cylinder back down on the power stroke. But because we don't have a firing event, our piston is just along for the ride and it travels back down on the power stroke, eventually taking the cylinder into vacuum. Now I went ahead and I did some overlays of this. I know you guys, I've seen a lot of different programs out there for overlays. I'm gonna go ahead and I took this and screenshotted this and put this into PowerPoint and did my own overlays on it. So why don't we just work through this here and we'll see what we got. Actually, before we do that, I just want to show you some cursors. So let's take this little blue circle over here and we want to label out, we'll label out zero degrees at our peak compression. So this is top dead, uh, top dead center on the, uh, between the compression and the power stroke. Top dead center right here, TDC. We're going to take our other one and we're going to go to the next TDC or our next firing event. So 720 degrees of difference here. This is two engine revolutions. Remember, our piston is going to travel up and down twice per single camshaft revolution. So one event of a cylinder, so intake, compression, power, and exhaust takes 720 degrees. What I want to label out here is the position of the pistons. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to select rulers here, and I'm going to throw in some partitions. And I want to see every 180 degrees, because what this is going to signify is our piston comes up, top dead center, we're going to call it zero degrees. Now our piston travels back down, bottom dead center, 180 degrees. Piston travels back up, we're back at top dead center, 360 degrees. Travels back down, bottom dead center, 540, and then back up on compression again at that 720 degree mark. 
So that's what these cursors are going to tell us. It's going to give us the position, basically, of where the engine is sitting right now without having to you know, take it apart and look inside of there. We are able to do this electronically now, which is fantastic. There's tons of lessons that can be involved in this. Again, today we're just looking at our exhaust valve. So let's go to that PowerPoint. So you can see I've done that. I took our 0, 180, 360, 540, and 720 marks and laid them over this. So if we put some, some color to this, let's go ahead and make this full screen. Here's what we're looking at. We have compression. Our piston is traveling up. We have power. Our piston is being forced down normally at this point when there's a firing event. And then we have our exhaust stroke. Our piston is traveling back up. We have our intake stroke. Our piston is on its way back down, drawing in our intake charge, drawing in our fuel and air. And then we build it up on compression again. We ignite the spark, and we start our power stroke again. This is what we're looking at here. We're looking at the cycles of the engine happening in this waveform. This is fantastic stuff, guys. Pressure transducers, super interesting for diagnosing internal engine problems. And that's what we're doing today. We're diagnosing an internal engine problem we're diagnosing a valve adjustment issue without pulling the covers off. I don't want to get my hands dirty, or I don't want to have to get my hands dirty if I don't have to. We want to work smarter, not harder. We're already, what, 20 minutes into this diag. Let's keep going. So here's what it would look like with multiple events. So here you can see we got three firing events. So again, compression, power, exhaust, Intake, compression, power, exhaust. So we have suck, squeeze, bang, blow, suck, squeeze, bang, and then it would be blow. You know, that's our, our cylinders, how they're working. And then you can also see down at the bottom here, I do have that ignition trigger on this one as well. Now, one thing that I want to note, you see this darker region here? This top cursor is drawn in at zero PSI. So anything that is sitting below this means our cylinder right now, our sealed chamber, is in vacuum, OK? That's going to be very important for what we're going to be looking at next. Our cylinder is in vacuum. We need to know that anything between those two cursors, for between 0 PSI and the bottom most point of our, of our graph here, is vacuum. OK? And vacuum is caused by the piston traveling down when, there is either, when it's either connected to the intake manifold or when it's sealed, you can see our, our cylinder should be sealed right now, right? On the power stroke, we should have the exhaust and intake valves closed. Pistons traveling downwards, it's pulling against those two closed valves, and we should have vacuum forming inside of that cylinder. Okay. So, we talked, or we are talking about a valve lash adjustment issue. What exactly does that mean? Why does that have anything to do with that electronic waveform we just captured? Here, check this out. So the lash adjustment is just going to adjust the clearance between the stem of our valve and the camshaft or the rocker arm or whatever it's riding on. We're adjusting that clearance. So let me grab this cylinder head here. Ooh. All right, cylinder head. Now this one has a nice removable body here with these right here. These are actually our adjusters on this vehicle. You can see we have a nut and then we got a little flat, flat spot there that we can take a screwdriver in there. What we're going to do is we're going to adjust these up and down to this point right here and how it contacts the valve on our engine. So if we go ahead and tip this guy over, pull our, pull our valve out. I already have the keepers out. Here's our valve spring. Here's our valve. Okay. So what we're adjusting is the clearance that's between this and whatever is pushing down on this, okay? Every time the cam comes around, either the cam pushes down on this or the rocker arm or whatever it might be is pushing down on this valve to open the valve to connect the cylinder to the exhaust port or the intake port, whatever it might be. This valve is being pushed down. Now, the reason why these Hondas tighten up, now, not every vehicle tightens up. The valves don't tighten. The clearances don't tighten on every vehicle. The reason these valves tighten up on these is because every time this valve in this cylinder head slams back home, our spring pulls this guy back home, every time this slams home, we're impacting the valve seat, the part where the valve contacts the cylinder head. It impacts against there every time it slams back home. That constant slamming on this cylinder head design 
forces our seat or impacts our seat into the cylinder head, meaning that every time we're taking just very, very, very small amounts, moving this valve upwards inside of the cylinder head, tightening that gap that we're seeing between here. So it's actually physical movement bringing this valve further up into the cylinder head, taking up our clearance. So what does that look like? Oh, by the way, our spec on our 0635 Odyssey, um, 11 to 13 thousandths gap between our valve and whatever the valve is riding on. So between, pop this guy back out, between these two points right here, we should be able to stick a feeler gauge in there and read 11 to 13 thousandths. What's happening? Our valve is getting closer or maybe even touching this point. So what does that mean? How does that affect this engine? Why is that giving us a misfire? Well, let's take a look. Okay. So here's our proper adjustment. We have an air gap in here, 11 to 13 thousandths of an inch. Our camshaft spins around. As it's just sitting here off of the lobe, so in its rest position off of the lobe, our valve is sealed up like it's supposed to be. Now say that we wear this thing really badly, our cylinder head becomes impacted, our seat becomes impacted, our valve is now touching our camshaft at all times, our, our, our wear has um, decreased that gap. It's possible that our valve were to hang open slightly even when the lobe isn't pushing it open. So our valve, it's possible, is no longer sealing. This is horrible for an engine. This allows that cylinder to allow that hot exhaust gas out on the power stroke to flow past the valve, this is what burns valves. The valve could be hanging open. Now, fortunately, on this one, I don't think that's the case yet. I don't think we're to that point yet, but if this thing were to keep going down the road, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 miles more, it's possible we could end up with a burned valve on this cylinder head. So here's proper adjustment. As the cam starts to come around, we just get a little bit of motion out of the valve as we start to touch the lobe here. Now, on a improper adjustment, our cam is going to open our valve sooner and it's going to open our valve faster and it's going to open our valve further. So you can see at the same position of the camshaft right here, our lines are in the same exact spot. Because of our lack of clearance in here, our camshaft actually touches the tip of the valve sooner, opens it quicker, and opens it further. You can see here our improper adjustment actually opens our valve further down. This is even worse when we get to this point. So our maximum um, lift on the valve, our maximum opening of the valve. Let's say that this is normal right here for our position. Now this is obviously overly dramatic and we're talking just thousandths of an inch here, but it matters on an engine. There's tons of hours of engineering that goes into the way these engines are designed. You start throwing thousandths of an inch off of opening and closing and duration, we end up with issues. You can see here, our valve is maybe only supposed to open this far, like the green line. Because we've taken up our slack, our air gap in there, our valve is opening further. It is also opening faster and sooner because of the contact point of when that lobe starts to open it. So again, at this point here, where we just come in contact with our cam, we're just seeing a little bit of movement on proper adjustment. We're seeing a huge amount of movement faster and sooner because of improper adjustment. What does this all mean? How does this all relate back to what we were just covering? Let's look at it. So here's our, here's our, our drawing here. Power, exhaust, intake, and compression. Now, as our piston's traveling down on power, our exhaust valve opens at some point, right? We have to exhaust out the cylinder. At some point, it's going to open during the power stroke, actually before bottom dead center. Before the piston's all the way down at the bottom, the exhaust valve is opened. So the way engines are, the rule of thumb is about 30 to 50 degrees before bottom dead center, we should see that exhaust valve open. We can measure that here. So what we're going to do, we're going to draw a line in at bottom dead center. At that 180 degree mark, our piston is sitting at the bottom of its travel and it's starting to head back up to force that exhaust gas up out of the exhaust. 180 degrees. Now we're going to track backwards. We're going to go back in time and we want to see when that exhaust valve opens. We're going to look for a point to where our cylinder stops drawing vacuum. So our cylinder right now, again, no explosion in there. So our cylinder's traveling down. It's created vacuum inside of that sealed container. There's vacuum being created because our piston is drawing against sealed valves up on top. It's drawing against that. It's drawing vacuum inside of that cylinder as it's coming down. Now at some point, our exhaust valve opens up. 
and it allows a, a, a pressure change. It allows a equalization of pressure. It allows that pressure to, to, to change. It allows our cylinder to no longer create vacuum because we just created a hole at the top allowing either exhaust pressure or um, ambient pressure to enter into the cylinder. So our piston's traveling down. We're looking for the point where it stops drawing vacuum. I've labeled that out right here. Drew a line. This is the exhaust valve opening. When we stop drawing vacuum, when that piston's traveling down and we stop drawing vacuum inside that cylinder, our exhaust valve is opened. We can measure that. So we put these two cursors up. And the way we do that, I'll just show you guys on the actual diagram. We're going to grab over here. We're going to throw one cursor at that 180 mark, roughly. That could be closer, I suppose. We'll try and make that better. Oy. OK, like so. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for the point of where it stops traveling, or it stops creating vacuum. So at some point here, we reach our lowest point. I'm bringing a cursor down from the top to put a parallel or, a, or a, a, just a line across here. And at some point here, we stop drawing vacuum and we start building pressure. But we're not building pressure. That's probably the wrong thing to say. We're equalizing pressure, OK? Because right here, and we'll just make sure that this is perfect. We'll put 0 in there. Right here is 0 PSI. Again, remember, I told you everything under 0 PSI is vacuum. So we're not building pressure at this point, really. We are equalizing pressure. We are bringing it back to atmospheric pressure, OK? So at this point, right about, I would, I would call it right about here, is where we stop going down, and we start evening out, and we actually start working our way back up, OK? Our piston is still traveling down until this 180 degree mark here. So our piston is still on its way down. It's still able to pull vacuum. If our exhaust valve never opened, we would see that drop even further down. But because we've opened a hole inside of our, our sealed container, we're allowing for a pressure equalization. And that's what we're seeing here. Our pressure is going to equalize until it returns back to either exhaust back pressure or ambient pressure. Whatever is sitting in the exhaust manifold, we're going to equalize to that. So you could see. Let's say this were to spike up to 5, 6 PSI. That could be because of exhaust back pressure. On this one, we have pretty good exhaust. But where do we know, how do we know what's good and what's bad? Now, I told you guys the spec. And again, this isn't a, oops, I think we're back at the beginning here. Let's go back to where we were. Now, I told you guys, rule of thumb, 30 to 50 degrees before top dead center, excuse me, before bottom dead center, before a piston's at the bottom, we want to see our exhaust valve open between 30 and 50 degrees. Now this isn't, uh, it has to be between here or it's bad. Okay, that's not the case. It's a rule of thumb. This is what we're looking for. And as you can see, as I measure out the delta, the triangle here, the change between point one at 180 degrees, uh, excuse me, between point one at exhaust valve open and point two, at 180 degrees, we see a 53.8 degree difference. It's a little further than our rule of thumb. Not huge. We're talking 3.8 degrees. But it is out of our rule of thumb spec. So this is the first thing that kind of leads us to a problem. Is this something where you want to tear an entire engine apart that doesn't have adjustable valves because of this problem? Probably not. But there's more we can look at here, OK? Now, I told you that our valve opens sooner, and I told you that it opens um, faster and further. It's more aggressive, basically, because we've taken up that air gap, and I can prove it. Right here is where exhaust valve closes. Um, I'm not going to focus on intake uh, valves and exhaust valves. I just wanted to show you guys that our exhaust valve closes right here. Again, we'll get into this in a different class. Um, but this is where exhaust valve closes. This, this bottom line right here, right in the center there, our exhaust valve has closed. So that's our duration of our exhaust valve. Now it would be wonderful if I could go out onto our service information and get a spec on what this looks like. Unfortunately, I can't. Some vehicles will give you a spec, some won't. Now that spec isn't always perfect either. That spec is typically written at 50 thousandths of travel. So our valve opened 50 thousandths. Now we start our counter. And our valve is 50 thousandths from closed. We start our counter. Okay? It's not a perfect opening and closing point. Now it could be argued that's when the valve starts to flow. That's a different topic for a different day. Right here, we're just going to talk about our, a little bit about our duration. 
Here's our intake valve duration again. We'll get into this in another class at some point, and in the center here we have our valve overlap. Here is a zoomed in picture of our exhaust valve duration. 269.5 degrees our exhaust valve is sitting open. Is this going to change? Will we see a change when we adjust our valves on here and get that air gap out of there? Will we see a change? What do you guys think? Put it down in the comments if you guys think it's going to change or if you think we're going to be sitting at this 269.5 degrees still. Curious to see what you guys think. All right. That is that. Now let's get to what really gives this thing away. Oh, sorry. Before we get there, here's just a pretty picture of what it all looks like. So power stroke, exhaust stroke, intake stroke, compression, and then where our valves are. So obviously on compression, our valves aren't open here and here. Our valves are open at these points right here, okay? And I just did this in PowerPoint really quick and easy. Um, but I'm sure, and I know for a fact, there are programs out there that will do this for you. All right. This is where we start to really get to the key information here. Our 53.8, not anything that I'm going to jump at and say this is bad and I can be 100% confirmed on that. I, I don't feel comfortable with saying it's only the 53.8 degree mark here that is our problem. Our problem lies with how quickly this happens. How quickly our cylinder goes from being in vacuum because our cylinder is still traveling down, how quickly, how quickly it goes from being in vacuum to being uh, to equalizing back to whatever pressures in the exhaust, so exhaust pressure or atmospheric pressure, whatever it is, how quickly that equalizes. You can see before our piston is even hit bottom dead center, before it's even at the bottom of its travel, we're back to atmospheric pressure. We're back to whatever this is, just below atmospheric pressure. This 180 mark crosses at this point. Now, I was able to find a known good off of this vehicle. Before we've even done the repair, found a known good, Look at this. Five degree difference, right? 48.7, 53.8, 5.1 degree difference. Not huge. It's not something that you're like, oh, five degrees of exhaust timing. That's obviously bad. We got to get in there and do something. We had a 20 degree window between 30 and 50 before. Five degrees, not what I'm concerned about. What I'm concerned about here is look at how our cylinder crosses our bottom dead center. Our pressure crosses our bottom dead center. This is good. We want our cylinder to still be working its way back to atmospheric pressure when it's starting to travel back up, okay? So our piston has hit bottom dead center. It's starting to travel back up. There was still a tiny bit of vacuum in there. Now we bring that piston back up and we're actually pushing on that cylinder. We're actually forcing air out. It will build pressure like this. We want our 180 degree mark, our bottom dead center, to cross somewhere in this section. So what's known good and known bad look like? Right here. Exhaust timing advanced? It's exactly what we're seeing here, right? That's exactly what this looks like. These are known goods and known bads. Exhaust timing advanced. Exhaust timing retarded. We get a much faster, or excuse me, a much slower return back to atmospheric, okay? And then our exhaust timing perfect, we want to fall somewhere inside of this window. Now there's a range, obviously there's a window. Um, it's not a perfect science that you can label degrees perfectly on every engine. Wear conditions, there's a ton, a ton, a ton of parameters that go around this. But this is telling me our story right here. What we want is we want our bottom dead center to cross somewhere before this point. Now I use the words advanced and retarded here. Because it is a timing advance or a timing retard, but why don't we have correlation codes? Why isn't this thing setting a timing code? That's because our timing actually isn't off on this engine. Our camshafts, our sprockets on the end, the timing's not off at all. It's the duration, it's the point, it's the point in time that our valve starts to open and how aggressively it opens that makes it look like advanced timing. Even though it's not, it makes it look that way. Now, you could end up with a similar thing if somebody were to take this is a crazy scenario and probably would never happen, but if you were to take the sprocket off the end of the camshaft and shift it on the camshaft just a little bit to where the sprocket was still in time but the camshaft wasn't, that's how this would look as well. You would not have time in correlation codes. The computer wouldn't know. It's looking at cam sensors and crank sensors, but the physical actual movement inside of the engine is different. 
it's not breathing the way it's supposed to. Remember back in this graph, I put those lines into the piston, uh, excuse me, into the camshafts. Because our camshafts are perfectly aligned like they're supposed to be. It's the point in which the lobe starts to turn the valve on, basically. We'll call it that, turn the valve on. I'm sure there's other wording, but it's that point where we start to turn the valve on and then how quickly and how aggressively that happens. Because of that lack of, of clearance in there, it's happening faster, it's happening sooner, and it's happening further, okay? I think that is it. Goods and bads, all right? So when you're doing this, you're taking a capture, that's our goods and bads. You always want to do this warm. This capture that we took right now was cold. These captures that I took right here are warm. There's going to be some difference in there because of expansion of metal. I like to take these captures warm, engine warmed up, engine idling. And then another good thing, record your idle RPM. And I did. We were sitting at about 700 and some RPM here. I, I have the exact number written down. Now when we fix this car and then compare it at the end here, I want that same RPM. And we're going to take a timing difference and see what exactly our difference is this thing. We're going to see, first of all, did our valve duration change from that 269.5 degrees? Did that change? Because in theory it should, right? Our valve is coming on sooner and it's staying on longer because we don't have that, that air gap in between the two surfaces anymore. So we might see a change in there. And then, does the point at which we cross bottom dead center returning back to atmospheric pressure does that change? Those are the two things I'm looking for to change when we do a capture on this thing afterwards. I think at this point, guys, I feel confident in selling this job to the customer. We have a problem. We were able to show it to them. We don't have a timing issue. This thing would set correlation codes if we did. You could go one step further. You could go ahead and scope your cam and your crank waveforms, and you could lay them on top of each other, make sure they line up. Sure, you could do that. This engine would set correlation codes most likely if it had an issue with the way the cam gear is lined up with the crank gear. We don't have a timing advanced issue on the exhaust cam. We have a cam lash adjustment issue. We're going to take the valve covers off, we're going to loosen up those nuts, and we're going to take a feeler gauge between there and measure it and adjust it. So that is going to be for another video. We're going to rip this engine apart. We're going to do all that. That's going to be for tomorrow night's video, guys. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope. I was able to explain it in a way that makes sense as to why, we're, why, why we can feel confident in this repair, why we can feel confident, confident in selling this to our customer. It is a maintenance item at the end of the day. These should have been inspected at 105. I would double that. They should be inspected at the 210 mark anyway. If you're comfortable with selling it that way to your customer, great. I'm not. I wanted to prove it and I think we did right here. So tell me what you guys think in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this. This was our first stab at um, in-cylinder pressure transducer stuff. We're gonna be doing it more. We're gonna be using more. I actually have a cylinder head sitting over there that had a burned valve that uh, we're gonna get into at some point as well. So keep an eye out for those classes. Otherwise, join us tomorrow night. We're gonna go ahead, rip this motor apart and fix it, and then the following night, we are gonna do some verification and repair at the end. So I hope you guys like what you saw. Please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't. Check us out, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. We're out on all of those. And until tomorrow night, guys, happy wrenching, and we'll see you then. Thank you.